Hey everyone, so if you have ever wondered if it is possible to propagate Anubias by seed, stay tuned because it is 100% possible and in this video I'm going to cover everything you need to know in order to propagate Anubias by seed. This includes how to get your plants to send out flowers in the first place, as well as how to collect the pollen and artificially pollinate those flowers, as well as how long you need to wait in order for those seeds to ripen and different germination techniques in order to get those seeds to grow. And in fact, as you can see, I have quite a few Anubius plants in my Emerse setup, and I actually have one plant in particular that has a flower that is ready to have its seeds harvested. So I'm gonna show you exactly how I go about harvesting those seeds, and we're actually gonna set up a little bit of an experiment where we plant those seeds in a few different methods in order to see which method actually gives us the best germination rate. So that going forward, we'll know exactly what is the best method in order to get these seeds to sprout. So we've got quite a bit to cover, so let's get started. All right, so the first step to doing this is to start growing your Anubias plants immersed. As you can see behind me, this is my ebb and flow immersed aquarium plant setup, uh, where I grow a lot of aquarium plants, including tons of Anubias. And as you can see here are a few of these specimens that I just pulled out of the system. And this is kind of what you're looking for for growing your Anubias plants is nice, really mature plants because the larger and more mature you can get your Anubias plant, uh, the bigger the flower is going to be and you'll get more pollen as well as more seeds from those flowers. And one of the benefits with this Immerse setup is it actually grows the Anubias plants much faster than you can if you're growing your plants in an aquarium. Uh, so it isn't actually that difficult to get Anubias plants to this size. Might take a little while, but it's definitely worth it. Now, in some cases, an Anubias plant can send out a flower when it's growing in your aquarium but it'll be impossible in order to properly pollinate that because as soon as the plant produces pollen, it'll just disperse that in your aquarium and you won't ever end up getting any seeds out of that flower. So it might look really cool in your aquarium if your Anubias plant sends out a flower, but unfortunately, because you just can't properly pollinate that flower, you'll never end up getting seeds from that. And so I've got quite a few videos on my channel about how I grow my immersed plants, so I'm not gonna get into it too much in this video, uh, but you can check out those videos if you are curious about getting a setup just like the one I have behind me. And so the next step, once you have an immersed grown Anubias plant, is to trigger it to send out a flower. Now, this will happen randomly as you're growing the plant, but there are a few tricks that you can do that definitely increase the amount of flowers that these plants will send up. So the first trick that I have found that works pretty well is simply reducing the nutrient levels in your growing container. Now, because technically the setup behind me is a hydroponic setup, I find this is the best method in order to do this because you can really easily manipulate the fertilizer levels in this system. You simply mix weaker fertilizers than you normally would. And the reason why this works in order to trigger flowers in your Nubius plant is because it reduces the amount of nitrogen. And when you have a lot of nitrogen in your fertilizer blend, it promotes a lot of vegetative growth in your plants. And so when you pull back those nitrogen levels, it tends to trigger the plants to go into a more flowering and blooming stage. And that's when you're gonna get a lot of flowers starting to grow off of your plants. And actually, I sometimes unintentionally do this when I get a little bit lazy and I don't replenish the nutrients fast enough in my setup. If I wait too long, sometimes it'll get to a point where all of a sudden my Anubius plants start to send out tons of flower stems and I know that I've waited a little bit too long in order to change those nutrients. And so the second trick that I have actually works a little bit better, and instead of just decreasing all of the nutrient levels across the board, you actually only decrease the nitrogen levels and instead increase potassium and phosphorus. Now in a hydroponic setup where you're mixing your own fertilizers, this is pretty easy to do, and it's actually the best method because the potassium and phosphorus are needed by the plants in order to send out flowers. And so once you do this, you'll get tons of really healthy flowers that have ton of pollen and they actually produce a lot more seeds. So now that we have our Anubias plants flowering, the next step is to collect pollen and artificially pollinate the flowers. Now, unfortunately, Anubias is not the type of plant that can self-pollinate. So this means we actually need two different types of plants that are flowering at similar times in order to collect pollen from one and pollinate the other. Now, in order to understand the pollination process, uh, there's a little bit of anatomy that we need to know about these flowers. And that is that the flowers have two distinct regions. The bottom of the flower is the female part and the top is the male part that actually produces the pollen. And what's actually interesting about these flowers is that the male and female portion of the plants don't ripen at the same time in order to prevent self-pollination. And so what ends up happening is when the flower first opens, the female part of that flower is most viable, and this is when you would have to artificially pollinate in order to get seeds. 
Now, a few days later, the male region of the flower will then ripen and it will produce pollen that you can actually harvest and then pollinate a different flower. So in order for this to work, we need to be able to collect pollen from one flower and then pretty much immediately deposit that onto the female portion of another flower that had just recently opened. And so as you can see, it gets a little bit difficult with the timing of the flowers. And that's why I have a higher likelihood of this being successful when I have a ton of Anubias plants and I trigger them all to send out flowers at around the same time so that the chances of having different flowers at different stages is a lot higher. So this is probably the most difficult part of the process because the timing needs to be perfect in order for it to work. But fortunately, what we can do is collect pollen from a male flower. And as long as we keep that pollen dry, it'll remain viable for a little while until another flower blooms and then we can cross pollinate the female portion of that flower. And so my preferred method for collecting the pollen is to use a small piece of paper. Oftentimes I'll use a post-it note or a small piece of aluminum foil and I'll just place that underneath the flower when I can see that it has a lot of pollen on it. And then you gently shake the flower over top of that piece of paper and you'll see all of that pollen drop onto the paper. As you can see, I've got a packet here of some pollen that I collected a little while ago. All I then do is fold up that piece of paper, seal it with some scotch tape and then write the date on it. And I find that that stores the pollen pretty good. And the actual pollination process is really quite simple. I'll just use a small paintbrush, just like the one I have here and dab it onto the pollen that was collected. And then just simply press that onto the female part of the flower pretty much as soon as the flower opens when it is most viable. And so that actually brings us to where we are today, where we have an Anubius plant that has been pollinated and is ready to have its seeds harvested. So I'm gonna show you exactly how I go about that. And so a little bit of backstory for this plant is that it's actually been 51 days since we've pollinated this. So that gives you a rough idea on how many days it takes to go from pollination to harvestable seeds. And the reason why I know the seeds are ready to be harvested is because after the flower has been pollinated, the female portion will tend to swell up a little bit and form little berries. And those will be green for quite a long time, but eventually it'll reach a point where those berries start to decay. And all of a sudden you'll start to see these white seeds start to burst from those berries. And that's actually what I've been starting to see on this plant. And so 51 days later, here we are, and it is ready to be harvested. Now, in order to harvest and germinate the seeds, it's pretty straightforward from this point. And there's a few different methods that we can go about doing that. And I mentioned earlier that we're going to set up an experiment and test a few of those different methods on germinating the seeds to see which one performs the best. So what we'll do is go ahead and harvest these seeds and we'll see how many seeds we get from this one flower. Then we'll break them up into a bunch of different groups and set up the different treatments for our experiment. So I'm just going to simply scrape those berries off of the main flower stem. And I'm going to then kind of separate as best I can the seeds from all of the other plant tissue. And after I've gone ahead and done all of that, I'm going to put them into a jar of dechlorinated water. And I'm just gonna gently shake them and agitate them in that water in order to further separate any plant material from the seeds. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm trying to get the seeds as clean as possible. So we reduce the chance of mold or fungus growing on the seeds, which could inhibit their germination. All right, so after cleaning the seeds, I'm noticing that we have two very distinct types of seeds from this flower. There are floating seeds that are larger and white in color. And then there are sinking seeds that are a lot smaller and they're more of an orangey tan kind of color. And so I'm not 100% sure if one is more viable than the other. And in fact, in gardening, I know that oftentimes people will do what's called a float test when they're about to sprout seeds, where they will throw a bunch of seeds in water and see which ones float and sink. And depending on the species of plant that you're trying to grow, uh, sometimes the floating seeds are the ones that are the most viable and sometimes the sinking ones are the most viable. And personally, I'm not sure if this is a thing when it comes to Anubias. So what we'll do is include this as our first variable in our experiment. So we'll separate these sinking seeds from the floating seeds and keep track of those in the experiment. So at the end, we'll know if one was more viable than the other. So in total, we got 53 floating seeds and 31 sinking seeds for a total of 84 seeds from one Anubias flower. So I think that's pretty decent. So the next step to germinating these Anubia seeds is to soak the seeds. And this is supposed to soften the seed wall and make it a little bit easier for the seeds to sprout. 
Now I've seen some conflicting information and I'm not sure if this is super required for Anubias because after all, these plants are growing in a high humidity environment. So it's not like the seeds have ever dried out and have a really hard shell. And in fact, you don't ever want the Anubias seeds to dry out because that will pretty much kill the seeds and make them no longer viable. So you want to keep these moist 100% of the time from when you harvest it. And so I'm not 100% sure if the soak is actually required. So what we'll do is include this as our next variable in the experiment. So we'll subject a portion of the seeds to a 24 hour soak in just regular dechlorinated tap water. And so we'll take the other portion of the seeds and we'll plant them directly without any kind of soak and we'll see if one performs better than the other. And lastly, there are many different kinds of substrates and methods to planting these seeds. Uh, but for this experiment, we'll test out two different methods. So the first one is going to be using these here, which are Jiffy Pods. And you've probably seen these or maybe even used them yourself in your garden. Because what this is, is basically a compressed peat mixture uh, that once you soak them in water, you end up getting something that looks like this. And the peat mixture is supposed to be really good at germinating seeds because it allows quite a bit of drainage for excess water uh, while also maintaining a really high moisture. And that's gonna be really critical for these Anubia seeds. So I'm excited to see how this peat mixture is gonna work. And so the next method that we'll test is by simply placing the seeds on some damp paper towel and containing that in a high humidity environment so that they can sprout and develop a little bit of a root structure, at which point we can then transplant them to another substrate where they can continue to grow. And so based on these different variables, we will have a total of eight different treatment groups. And I'll put a breakdown on the screen here so you can see exactly the combinations as well as how many seeds are gonna be in each treatment group for this experiment. And I'll go ahead and prepare all the different pots for this experiment. All right, so I just finished planting all of the seeds for this experiment and I have everything in this top bin here of my ebb and flow system. So hopefully we start to see some sprouting soon. All right, so a few things to mention with this experiment. Now the paper towel treatment, I have those small little containers floating in this tub as well, because I want all of the seeds to be growing in the same temperature and humidity as one another, just to keep this experiment as even as possible. And also one difference to note is that the paper towel treatment is just having the seeds soaked in some dechlorinated tap water, whereas the peat treatment are in contact with the nutrient water that gets cycled through this ebb and flow system. So there is gonna be some differences between the amount of nutrients uh, that the seeds are exposed to, which I've seen some conflicting information where excess nutrients can actually inhibit germination. So I think that's important to note and we'll see exactly how these seeds do in this experiment. Also for the paper towel treatment, I also have those seeds covered by a sheet of paper towel and that's just to reduce some of the light uh, that hits the seeds as well as hopefully reduce some algae growth uh, that might be covering those seeds and inhibiting their germination. As for the seeds that are growing in the peat mixture, I have some empty net pots just sitting on top just so that it's shading out some of the light as well uh, because I don't want algae or moss growing and covering those seeds before they have a chance to sprout. So we'll let these seeds go and we'll check in on them in a few weeks and hopefully we have some sprouting by then and we can compare the germination rates between all the different treatments. So if you like this kind of video where we set up and run different aquarium plant experiments, I have a few more experiments that we've actually ran in the past that you might enjoy. So I've put together this playlist here that you can click through and watch all the different experiments that we've ran on this channel. And I'm sure you'll find some videos that you really enjoy. So thank you very much for watching and until next time, take care.